Our second reading this morning comes to us from Luke's Gospel, and this morning our passage is the Good Samaritan, which might be one of the most familiar passages to people, even if they don't go to church. Everyone's heard this story before, so hopefully as you hear it this morning, you can hear something new in this very old, well-told parable. Our passage is Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Listen to God's word for the church this morning. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our story today really begins with what I call a snarky question. A lawyer, or perhaps more accurately, a religious scholar stood up to test Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks. Now, I love questions. If there's one thing I want the teenagers in Sunday school to learn, it's that I a million times prefer a good question over a nice and tidy Sunday school answer. Because I think it's absolutely true what the theologian, Jewish theologian Abraham Heschel said, that we are all closer to God when we are asking questions than when we think we know the answers. Questions and lively theological debate were a central expression of faith in the Jewish world that Jesus was part of. So on the surface, this religious scholar's question seems like it could be genuine, even if missing the point, what must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks Jesus. It's not the question per se, but the spirit in which it's asked that sends this story down the path that it takes. The religious scholar stood up to test Jesus. We see this word in other places in Luke's gospel. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, lead us not into temptation, right? Which is the same word, literally into a time of testing. After Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus quoted scripture saying, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The religious scholar stood up to test Jesus. He stood up to outsmart him, to trick him. And I don't know about you, but when I know someone is setting up a question trap for me. I don't respond well. Snarky question. You're probably going to get a snarky response if not just completely ignored. 
But not Jesus, of course. Jesus knows exactly how to graciously not miss a constructive teaching moment. And so he answers this man with a question of his own. <laughs> what is written in the Torah? What do you read there? Quick-thinking Rabbi Jesus asks this man to answer his own question. And of course the religious scholar has the correct Sunday school answer responding with a verse at the heart of Torah and at the heart of Jewish faith. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And to this, Jesus says, yes, right answer. Do this, and you will live. The question's answered, everyone's happy, they all go home. End of story, right? Even though it seems like these two are on the same page, this religious scholar is still looking for something to be right about, wanting to be divisive, to sound smart, to pick a fight where there isn't one. This guy would have loved Facebook. He looks at Jesus and he asks his perfectly calibrated, tricky follow-up question. So who exactly is my neighbor, Jesus? And if you listen closer to this question, you'll hear the other questions behind it. Who is not my neighbor? Who can I ignore? Who does not matter as much? Who exactly do I need to love in order to get into heaven? In his introduction to this Good Samaritan passage in his I've been to the mountaintop speech, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says, now that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate. But Jesus immediately pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. Jesus did not engage in a philosophical debate or an argument. Instead, he told a story. He brought the theoretical to the ground, the abstract into the dirt. He inserted the hypothetical into real life. The 18-mile road between Jerusalem and Jericho was notoriously a dangerous one. And so it became the setting for Jesus' parable where a man is beaten and left half dead on the side of the road. And you know the story, the priest and the Levite who are walking back to Jericho from Jerusalem, both of them just walk right on by. And many have suggested that they walked by because of purity laws, which required inconvenient protocols after coming in contact with a dead body. A suggestion which has fed an anti-Semitic interpretation insinuating that Jewish leaders valued ceremony over human life. And the problem with this reading is that the Torah places an even higher value on tending to the injured and saving human life and especially treating a dead body with honor and respect. So the issue here with the priest and the Levite is not restrictive purity codes, but something more universal and human, which made them walk right on by. Perhaps they had a busy schedule that day. They had a meeting to get to in Jericho. Perhaps they assumed that the man in the ditch was himself dangerous, had chosen a life that had led to these consequences. Maybe they thought it was his fault that he had ended up this way. Or did they think that they wouldn't even know how to help, that maybe someone else could do a better job at it? My guess is that at the heart of their inaction was fear. Fear of what might happen to them if they did stop. After all, this was a dangerous road and there were obviously dangerous people in the area. But then a Samaritan walks by. He stops and without hesitation goes above and beyond to get this man the help that he needs. And a quick reminder about Samaritans and Israelites, they were not exactly friendly. In the previous chapter of Luke's Gospel, Jesus and his disciples had just entered a village of Samaritans where they were not welcomed with hospitality. 
And the disciples turn to Jesus and say, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And Jesus rebuked them, and I imagine he also sighed deeply. You see, these two groups had a long history, once part of one nation, but divided when they followed different kings, and history carried them off in different directions. Like estranged siblings with centuries of animosity built up between them. They were divided in leadership, each thinking the other side worshipped God in the wrong way and in the wrong place. So we can imagine their surprise when it's the Samaritan who ends up being the good one in this story. The one the disciples had just wished for fire from heaven to come down and consume. Which of these three was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers, Jesus asked. The scholar said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Probably not the answer the religious scholar wanted. Sometimes your neighbor is not someone who lives in your neighborhood. Sometimes your neighbor isn't even someone you like. Sometimes your neighbor is someone you might even consider an enemy. Jesus expands the identity of neighbor here in ways that should make all of us uncomfortable because that's the point of a parable. But not only does Jesus expand this idea of neighbor, he changes the whole concept of neighbor from an identity to an action. In a way, he changes neighbor from a noun into a verb. In his parable, neighbor is not a person. Neighbor is something you do. The one who is the neighbor is the one who showed mercy. And Jesus tells all of us to go and do likewise. Go and neighbor the world which is so hungry for neighboring. Who is my neighbor? The religious scholar had asked, wondering who he needed to help in order to get into heaven. And in the end, Jesus responds saying, you are. You are a neighbor when you show compassion. You are a neighbor when you help others having a rough time on the path of life. You are, when you don't allow fear or busyness or bias to stop you from doing what is needed to make other people whole. Neighbor is not a category of people who need help. It's the one who sees others and does the helping. In the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I've Been to the Mountaintop speech, the Reverend King was rallying support for the sanitation workers in Memphis who were striking for better working conditions and higher pay. And acknowledging the risks and fear of joining the movement, he appealed to this story of the Good Samaritan, observing that both the priest and the Levite passed by the injured man, fearfully asking, what will happen to me if I stop and help? But when the Samaritan passes by, he instead asks, what will happen to him if I don't? King acknowledged the tendency of all of us to first ask, what will happen to me if I stop and help? But also, how important it is to also ask the question the other way around as a Samaritan. What will happen to them if I don't? Being a neighbor means learning to ask the question the other way around. May we learn to ask it. And filled with compassion and moved with mercy, may the Spirit move us to act with courage on life's dangerous roads. In the name of Jesus Christ, may we all learn to be the neighbor that the world needs right now. Amen. I invite you now to join me to stand as we say together what we believe. This morning, our affirmation of faith comes from the Confession of 1967. We believe that in Jesus of Nazareth, true humanity was realized once for all. Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, 
lived among his own people and shared human needs, temptations, joys, and sorrows. He expressed the love of God in word and deed and became a brother to all kinds of sinful people. In giving himself for them, he took upon himself the judgment under which all people stand convicted. We believe that God raised him from the dead, vindicating him as Messiah and Lord. The victim of sin became victor and won the victory over sin and death for all. <laughs> 